Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Courtright's online service for May 31st. My name is Allison Pinches, and I'm one of the pastoral staff here at Courtright, and it is my pleasure to welcome you this morning from wherever you are, from whenever you are joining us. Please know that we are delighted that you are here with us and that it is good to be together, uh, together in community, even in this virtual way. So thank you for joining us today. Just a couple of brief announcements before we begin our time together. Uh, Debbie Coots has volunteered kindly to be kind of coordinating uh, some meals for us in this time. Usually we have a freezer in our kitchen that's stocked full of meals that we're able to share with one another as various needs come up. Uh, but at this time, uh, we're not accessing uh, the kitchen and that freezer. So Debbie Coots has volunteered to kind of coordinate that. So if you would love to help prepare a meal for somebody that might be glad of it, if you could email her. Uh, her email will appear on the screen, debcoots at gmail.com. Or if you or if you know of somebody who would be really grateful for a meal at this time, there's all kinds of reasons why a meal might be helpful. And we would love to bless you or somebody that you are aware of in our congregation that would appreciate that. So you can also let her know about that. And many thanks to Debbie for being willing to coordinate that for us. Um, otherwise, our uh, habits continue of our sort of ways of online meeting and connecting and once again want to invite you into those if you're not part of a neighborhood group or a small group or you're looking for other ways to connect we know that there's a lot of us that are feeling the cost of this social isolation at this time and we have ways that we would love to connect you so if you're not even sure what the right thing is for you please just send me a quick email allison at courtrightchurch.org and i would love to help you figure out what might be a good spot for you to connect after our service today, once again, we'll have prayer ministers that would love to pray with you. Uh, there will be a, a link, or you can go to our courtrightchurch.org slash online, and there should be links there as well. Um, and that will take you into a prayer room, and there's uh, people that would love to pray with whatever you have on your mind and heart today. And then after the service today, we also will be having our talk back time. Uh, so that will be a time to chat with um, those of us that have been preaching recently, so Pastor Alex and Justin and myself, and we'd love to talk, chat with you a little bit more about our current sermon series. Uh, we've just started. We've had one week in Ephesians, and this is our second week, um, and we'd love to have some discussion with you after the service. So there's also a link um, available at that same online page uh, to be able to join us after the service. We're now going to hear uh, some special words. This this Sunday is actually Pentecost Sunday, and that's the Sunday where we remember and thank God for the incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, the part of the triune God, the Holy Spirit uh, gives power to the ministry of Jesus and the church, and so we, uh, we want to remember and celebrate that together this morning. And so as we remember when the Holy Spirit came on those early believers, uh, as told in the story of Acts, uh, we celebrate and are grateful for this gift of the Spirit. And so let's hear these words together as we uh, enter into worship this morning. Dan tampaklah kepada mereka lidah-lidah seperti nyala api yang bertebaran dan hingga pada mereka masing-masing. Kedini, dah sengyangi cuman amal baku, sengyangi maragi asimul tara. Nah, buka Yerusalemu wali kuwako wa Yahudi watu wa mchao mungu wali otoka katika kila inji duniani. Ouvindo se este som, ajuntou-se uma multidão que ficou perplexa, pois cada um ouvia falar em sua própria língua. Mereka semua tercengang-cengang dan heran lalu berkata, Bukankah mereka semua yang berkata-kata itu orang Galilea? Uriga... Frígia e Panfilha, Egito e das partes da Líbia, próximas a Sirene, visitantes vindo de Roma. Baik orang Yahudi maupun penganut agama Yahudi, Orang Kreta dan orang Arab, 
kita mendengar mereka berkata-kata dalam bahasa kita sendiri tentang perbuatan-perbuatan besar yang dilakukan Allah. Então Pedro levantou-se com os onze e em alta voz dirigiu-se à multidão. Homens da Judéia e de todos e todos os que vivem em Jerusalém, deixe-me explicar-lhes isso. Ouçam com atenção. Orang-orang ini tidak mabuk seperti yang kamu sangka, karena hari baru pukul sembilan. Inen gok sanjija yoer el tongaya maestima shingoshini illustre. Katika siku sila samusho, alisema buana, itawa miminia binadamu wate roo wangu. Watoto wenu wakiume na wakike watatoa unabi. Vijana wenu watao ona maona, na wase wenu watao otandoto. Sobre os meus servos e as minhas servas, derramarei do meu espírito naqueles dias, e eles profetizarão. Dan aku akan mengadakan mujizat-mujizat di atas, di langit dan tanda-tanda di bawah, di bumi, darah dan api dan gumpalan-gumpalan asap. Amen. This morning we celebrate Pentecost and it is an incredible opportunity to explore the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit that unifies, the Spirit that reveals truth, the Spirit that does miraculous, profound things in our world. And I don't know about you, but when I look at what's going on in our world today, when I see what's even just in the news this week, my heart is yearning for a move of God's Spirit to be not just the comforter. We know the Holy Spirit is the great comforter, but we also know that the Holy Spirit can do incredible, miraculous things. And when I look at the injustices in the world around us, when I look at the uh, disunity in the world around us, I think to myself, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. So maybe we should just start with that this morning. Just reminding ourselves of that ancient prayer, Holy Spirit, come. Would you pray that just wherever you are? Holy Spirit, come. Maybe just either out loud where you are or in the comments or with, the, or with your family or just by yourself, would you just uh, ask the Holy Spirit to invade some part of your life that you need or that the world needs to bring healing, to bring restoration, to bring justice? Spirit come. Holy Spirit come. Holy city over our nation we pray it over so much of what we've seen in the news this week we pray it over a broken world holy spirit come amen 
Let's continue to sing songs. We're going to sing a couple songs just reminding us of, of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Holy fount of inspiration by whose gift the great of old spoke the word of revelation marvelous and manifold God the Spirit we adore thee in the triune Godhead one one souls from stains of earth. God the Spirit, we adore thee in the triune Godhead one, one in love, in power and glory with the Father and the Son. When we wander, Lord, direct us, keep us in the Master's way. Let thy strong, swift sword protect us, warring in the evil day. Shall the church now faint or fear? When the Comforter is near, shall the church now faint or fear? When the Comforter is near, God the Spirit, we adore Thee in the triune God. One in love, in power and glory, with the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son. Amen. We also ask the Holy Spirit to be our guide, to lead us when we don't know where we're to go. Holy Spirit, guide my vision, help me see the way you see. Always Jesus, ever Jesus Christ in all as Christ in me. Holy Spirit, guide my speaking words of grace and truth abound. Let my lips be filled with stories of the mercy that I found. You're the light. You're my path. You're the shed. All I am, all I have, Holy Spirit, lead me on. Holy Spirit, 
guide my hearing, awake my ears to words you speak. In the thunder, in the stillness, let your voice be clear to me. You're the light, you're my path, you're the shade. quieter. You're the light. You're my path. You're the shepherd of my soul. All I am, all I have. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, that is our prayer, that you would lead us into the unknown, lead us into where you would have us. May we just be in the center of your will. And God, we recognize that there are so many times when we are not in that place, when we are not uh, in the center of who you are and your will for us. And God, we are sorry for that, where we are not paying attention to what your spirit is saying, or we are willfully disobeying what your spirit's voice is calling us to do. God, by your strength in us, would you allow us to be better stewards of listening to your voice, to listening to what you would call us to do. May we be a church, and may we be a people who do that, who hear and respond to your Holy Spirit's leadings and promptings. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Alex, and I'm the lead pastor here at Courtright. I want to welcome you to our online service today, whether you're watching live or streaming it later in the day or later in the week. We're glad you're joining us. Last week, we started the new sermon series in the New Testament book we call Ephesians. We also ordained new elders as part of the service. And one of those elders, Barb Ferrier, uh, used two images to describe what she believes God is doing in the church right now. And I found them quite inspiring. And I think actually they help us as we embark on this journey through Ephesians. So the first image was of a potter, that God is shaping us as a potter would shape a lump of clay. And the second image was that uh, we, are, as the church, are... On, it's been as though we've been on a cruise ship lounging around on deck, and now God is sending us out in smaller speedboats on his mission. Uh, many of us are eager to get going. We want to know what we have to do. We're asking questions like, when can the church reopen? How are we going to make that happen? But before we answer those questions, we have to first deal with our identity. I, I've described what we're going through the pandemic uh, before as a kind of identity crisis. And I believe that through this experience, God wants to shape us so that we are more like him. That's part of his purpose in this. Because we can be busy, we can be really active, and, and yet we can be completely lost through all of that. 
So you can think of this series in Ephesians as an exercise in Christian formation for yourself. I hope you'll lean into it that way, but also for our congregation and beyond. For the first three chapters of his letter, Paul talks about who we are as the church of Jesus Christ. Those are the pottery chapters. In the next and final three chapters, we get into our speedboats and he sends us out on his mission. Last Sunday, we looked at the first two verses of Paul's letter and we focused on three words in particular, uh, saints or holy ones and grace and peace. We also talked about the Apostle Paul, the author of this letter, and his relationship with the Christians in the city of Ephesus and the city itself, what it was like, its culture. This morning, we're going to read farther. We're going to read up to verse 14. So if you want to grab a Bible, this would be a good time to do that. Let's pray before we begin to read. Holy Spirit, this morning, we remember how you showed up that first Pentecost Sunday. You help people to understand your word. You broke through the barriers that keep us apart. Barriers of language, culture, race. And you brought unity in Jesus Christ. We're asking you to do that again today. Would you do that for us as individuals? Would you do that for us as a church? And across the wider church of Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. So reading Ephesians 1, verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, so Paul's saying that he's the author of this letter, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love to travel, and we can't travel as much as we used to be able to right now. So I've been thinking back on some of the trips I've taken, and it occurred to me that uh, the first thing I almost always do when I go to a new place is that I try to get my bearings as quickly as possible. And in order to do that, you need a good view. And so if I'm in a city, I will try to find the center of the city and a tall building that I can go up. Because when you're walking through the streets, all you can see is what is right in front of you. But when you get to the top of the CN Tower in Toronto, or when you climb Grouse Mountain in Vancouver, you see it all laid out before you. It's like a map. You can see how the different parts fit together and you start to be able to figure out your place in it all. You get a much better sense of direction. This opening section of Ephesians gives us an incredible view of what Paul is going to talk about in the whole letter. Really, it's a summary of Christian identity. Who are we? We get our answer to that question in verses 3 to 14, and it's one long sentence in the original Greek made up of 202 words. It's a sentence that theologians absolutely love and English teachers hate. It's one long, Holy Spirit-inspired, run-on sentence. 
and it features 24 verbs. God is the subject 20 times, we are only four times. God initiates, he blesses, he chooses, he predestines and adopts, he bestows grace, he redeems and forgives, he lavishes, he makes known and he gives purpose, he unites together in Christ, he works and he seals. For our part, we listen, we receive, we believe, and we hope. Isn't that amazing? God is doing all of these things right now for you, for me, for all of us. So this morning, I want to highlight five of those verbs. That we are blessed, we are adopted, we are redeemed, we are chosen, and we are sealed. The first thing is that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. And that's right now, not later when we become a better Christian, but now. Blessing is this kind of churchy word that we sometimes use, many of us, I think, without giving it much thought. But blessing is what we need most of all. Blessing means every joy, every benefit you've ever longed for. And yet, not what we expected. And it may surprise you to hear that you've already got it. Every blessing is yours right now. To be a Christian is not simply to have a Lord to obey or an example to follow or a Savior to rescue you. But more profoundly even, you are put in Christ. We are united with him. You can think of it as being like marriage. In most legal systems in the world, if you're married, you share your spouse's wealth. We didn't bring much to this relationship, but in Christ, we have it all. Sometimes we talk about the Christian life as a journey, and there's truth to that, but a deeper truth is that you're in Christ and you have all the benefits right away, right now, period. People sometimes say to me, Pastor, I'm trying to be a good Christian. And at that point, I have a choice. Will I quote John Calvin or will I quote Yoda? And I brought Yoda along with me this morning just for fun. I, I also meant to bring my John Calvin bobblehead doll, but I forgot it at home, which may be a good thing because it fell off my desk a couple years ago and Calvin's face broke in half, so his mouth is missing. Um, but we have his books, so, so Calvinists out there everywhere, forgive me. This morning we're going with Yoda. In The Empire Strikes Back, and if you're a Star Wars fan, you will certainly be familiar with that film, the best of the bunch, in my view, anyway. In that movie, when Luke Skywalker goes to the Dagobah system to learn how to be a Jedi uh, under the tutelage of Yoda, the same Yoda. And by the way, this is a very small Yoda, but it's not baby Yoda. Uh, this is, you can, you can tell because he's kind of balding. This is, this is, adult Yoda. This is mature, wise Yoda. Uh, but baby Yoda is very cute. I think we can all agree on that. So Luke finds himself learning from his master Yoda, and he's facing a difficult task at one point, and he tells Yoda that he'll try to carry it out. And Yoda replies, he kind of wrinkles up his green face and looks unhappy, and he says, do or do not. There is no try. Well, the Christian life is like that in a way. If you're trying to be a good Christian, I really don't like your chances. You're either all in Christ or you're not. There is no try. This doesn't mean you need a dramatic conversion story. Most of us don't have that, but there was a point, a turning point, when you started to trust. You may not even have realized exactly when it was. And from that moment, you were all in. Salvation is by grace. It comes only as a gift. Jesus said, it is finished. He did it for us. Every other worldview or religion makes you earn it. You have to work for it. You have to be a better person. You have to achieve things. You have to make something of your life. And if that was true, if the Christian life was like that, then it could be done in stages. But it's not. In Christ, you are all in. 
you have every blessing right now. And that's how Paul starts his letter, with that word of encouragement. Next, Paul gets specific about how we're in Christ. And he talks about how we're adopted and redeemed. First of all, adoption means that through Christ, God is not just almighty, that he becomes your father. This means that you have access, and access is so important in our relationship to God. In fact, you can think of the whole New Testament from Genesis 4 to the very end of it as an experience of fulfillment denied, of of longing to be close to God, of the people of Israel wanting that but not having access to him. You can also think of this as a child needs attention from their parent. Some of us may have painful childhood memories of a parent not being around or not making us a priority. Maybe your mom or your dad was busy with other things. I know as a parent, I can say that that there's pressure and guilt wrapped up in that, needing to be accessible, wanting to be, but sometimes failing at that. Well, God is the most powerful person in the universe, and powerful people are usually pretty busy, but God is never too busy for us. If you're his child, you can run into his arms anytime. He is ready to embrace you as his own, his beloved. Adoption also means inheritance. I don't know whether you cringed when you heard that we're predestined for worship, but or for sonship rather, um, But it would have been understandable if you did because we're used to inclusive language these days. But there's a reason that specific word sonship is used here. In the ancient world, only sons could inherit wealth. Daughters could not. And Paul is saying here that in Christ, both men and women have that privilege and can inherit everything in heaven and on earth, which is very inclusive. Adoption also means discipline. As every parent knows, we all have trouble in this life. Everyone has to deal with suffering. But your Heavenly Father promises that your suffering won't be for nothing. Instead, He ensures that it helps you to grow up, that it will make you more mature, that it turns you into gold, reflecting God's goodness. That is Christian formation. We're also redeemed. You might have heard if you're familiar with the dictionary definition of redemption, that that it means having your debts paid. But here it's the word for ransom. I have a story I like to tell about redemption. Have you ever had your car towed before? It's one of the worst feelings you can have. When my parents first moved to Boston uh, at the end of high school, when I finished high school, they made the move with my little brother. I was in Boston and I wasn't familiar with the city and I was out Uh, in their car for the first time uh, driving around and and I parked somewhere and and went to look at something and when I came back the car wasn't there and I realized that I parked illegally and the car had been towed and there's a process then you go through when you get over how upset you are to get the car back I had to go to what they called a redemption center and when you paid the fine they stamped your receipt in big block red letters, redeemed. And they do that because you're not just paying a debt. You're actually getting your car out of captivity, if you want to think of it that way. To be redeemed is more than having your debts paid. It's a release from slavery. We need God's grace first. Who am I? That's the question we're asking. We may be confused, but I think all of us have a a deep sense that we're not who we should be. And so we feel the need to prove ourselves, to fill ourselves up. And you can do that in secular ways or in religious ways by trying to be a good person. Wherever it is that you're looking for satisfaction, however you're trying to earn approval, that thing will enslave you if you let it, whether it's your job, your pleasures, some success you're pursuing, your family, a relationship, all good things. But in the end, you risk serving those things as master. Because if you love anything more than God, not only will it let you down in the end, it will destroy you. 
Redemption is what frees us from that bondage. Right now, during this pandemic, I believe God is stripping away many of the things we used to be tempted to live for. He's tearing down our idols. Ephesus was a city full of idols. We have them too in our culture, but they're more hidden. True freedom only comes through the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus gives his life, not as an example, not for anyone else, but for me, in my place. He's taken the penalty for what was wrong with me, for my sin. And so I finally see the value I've been looking for, that I've been trying to get from elsewhere. And that's what takes the rest of your life, for that truth to sink into your heart, to work its way into every part of who you are. The climax of this opening part of Paul's letter comes in verse 10, when the times reach their fulfillment and everything will be brought into unity under Christ. When will that be? It sounds pretty good. Well, Paul doesn't tell us when, but he says that God has a plan. Of course, that's not what a lot of people believe in our world. You can think of Shakespeare's play Macbeth. The lead character in that play says that life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and signifying nothing. So all the drama we go through has no ultimate meaning, according to that suggestion. And that's one approach, that there's no design, that our lives are random. Ephesians, on the other hand, says everything is by design and that it's based on God's plan. So here's the big question. Are we free or does God have a plan? And the Bible says yes to both of those things. But some say that we don't have freedom, that our future is determined by our family of origin, our education, our culture, even our DNA. We don't want to believe that. The North American dream is life's what you make of it. We are individualists and we tend to deny how much we're the product of other forces. We want our freedom most of all, but if we got it, would we know what to do with it? I'm married to an amazing woman named Judith. Some of you know her. If I ever doubt God's grace, all I have to do is to turn and look at my wife. Before I met Judith in my early 20s, I dated someone for a few years and we thought we'd get married. I wanted that, but it didn't happen and it broke my heart. At that time, um, I was incredibly upset and that experience actually brought me back into a relationship with Christ. What I was seeing at the time was what was just right in front of me, and that was all. I didn't have God's perspective. I, I didn't really know what was good for me. You can look back on your life um, at a certain point. You look back and you realize that it was a huge mercy that you weren't able to choose for yourself how things would go. There's grace and peace and hope in God's plan. So there are two views that are prevalent here. First, that life is all predetermined, that you have no real choice in the matter, and that is something that can take away your hope. You might feel helpless. The other view says that your future is up to you, and that is a heavy weight to bear. In the end, no one can live up to that. What God says is that your choices matter. There are consequences and he holds you responsible. But at the same time, God offers us, God brings all of our free choices together in his will so that everything works out in a perfect plan. God is in control and yes, you are free to choose. This is really important, not just because we want to have good doctrine, uh, because theology matters, but also because it's personal and it affects how we experience the Christian life. It's all about the grace and the peace that God means for us to receive from the Holy Spirit. Paul says, you're responsible, so you need to pay attention and be careful. But in the end, you can relax, you can be at rest. And I think rest is so hard for many of us to find a lot of the time. God has a plan and it's moving in exactly the right direction, no matter how it may seem to you right now. 
would you say that you have that peace in your life? Because the Bible teaches us that it only comes as we embrace what Scripture teaches about human freedom and about God's plan for history, your history. In the end, God promises that everything in heaven on earth will come together under Christ. There will be unity and harmony. Right now, not so much. We don't see a lot of that unity and harmony out there in the world. If you go back to Genesis 3, the beginning of the Bible, where our relationship with God fell apart, everything else fell apart too, even within ourselves. At some level, we're all asking this question, who am I? And that confusion, that doubt, even that very question points to our lack of inner harmony and peace. We, we feel this tension within ourselves, kind of an internal discord. We also fight with other people. We fight with our friends. We fight within our families. Races fight and countries go to war. We're seeing that, especially the, the race conflict right now with the protests in Minnesota and across the US. And so you might ask yourself, what hope do we have with all of this going on and having gone on for as long as anyone can remember? Well, the Holy Spirit offers us hope and steps into that conflict and does two things. First of all, he seals the truth of the gospel that we are blessed, adopted, redeemed, chosen. He seals all of that on our hearts. You can think of that as being like the seal on a bottle of Tylenol. God seals us to protect us from tampering, from, from anything uh, harmful coming in from the outside. The Spirit is our shield and our guardian, even when we wander and when we give him grief, which we do all too often. But on top of that, the seal in ancient times was something we're not too familiar with. It was a way to identify what belonged to you. It was the mark of ownership. If your seal was on something, a document or one of your possessions, then it was clearly your own. So the Holy Spirit guarantees that we belong to God, that he will never leave us, that we are his. And he also makes it personal. Paul says in Galatians 4 and in Romans 8 that you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received God's spirit, capital S spirit, when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba. That's an Aramaic word that means father. And, and even more literally translated, you might say it means daddy. It's this intimate term. Now we call him father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are all part of God's family. If you want to grow in grace and peace, if you want to love God more through Jesus, then look to the Holy Spirit. Ask him for help with that. Maybe you're someone who has never felt an emotional engagement with God, with Jesus. The Holy Spirit wants to rush to your side and lead you on that path. The Holy Spirit fills our hearts, motivates us, moves us, turns us to God in a way that's, that's not just head knowledge, it's not just an intellectual engagement, but it's, it's a love, it's a, a profound sense of breathing with the Spirit, of being close to the Spirit. He's the one who enables us to trust who makes it real and personal and close, like the best relationship you could ever imagine between a parent and a child. And we're all in this together as well. We're adopted into a family, the church. That's the meaning of Pentecost. In Christ, we are becoming the church across every barrier. With everything going on in the States right now, racism is on our minds. It's here in Canada too, let's not pretend otherwise. We hurt each other and we keep on doing that. Those with power and privilege do it. Those who don't have power and privilege do it. Sometimes we do it actively. Other times we're not aware of it. When will justice and violence end? That's one of the questions I think we ask throughout our lives. Well, Ephesians tells us that God sends his Holy Spirit as a deposit on that ending. He promises to heal and restore 
everything and that it will be completely fulfilled in Christ. But that will not come based on our best efforts. It never has, it never will. Remember Yoda in this. I'll reach down and grab him uh, for a little moment with Yoda here. Yoda said there is no try. So we've kind of co-opted that and recognized that we can't do this on our own. And, And that is the very beginning of Christian faith, that all of this is only possible through the blood of Jesus, thanks to his sacrifice. If you think about it, blood is a sign of things falling apart, tearing apart. Yesterday, I dropped something on my leg and it it bled. And the reason there was blood is that the skin broke. The skin tore apart. Jesus bled. He was torn apart for you and for me. And that happened so that everything and everyone could come together in true peace. In Christ, you who are once far away have been brought near to God and into his family only by his blood. That's a love that changes the world. And God is pouring that kind of love into us together as his church. As we go through this book of Ephesians, we're going to see how that plays out in our friendships and families, in our church, in our society. And my prayer for you and for all of us is that you will know who you are in Christ together with his saints, holy and faithful, set apart for his purposes, that you will know that God has chosen you and blessed you with every blessing and that he's adopted you into his family, the church, that he's redeemed you from every burden, freed you from your guilt and regret so that you are truly free in Jesus Christ and that at the cross you are made new. You are his new creation, filled with the hope of the resurrection, sealed on your heart and your mind by the Holy Spirit, and that he is bringing you in all things to fulfillment according to his good, good purposes in his time based on the plan, the perfect plan that he has for you and for me. May you rest in that knowledge, that confidence of who you are in Jesus. Grace and peace to you. Amen. This morning we have been reminded of the incredible truths of how we are in Christ and the story of our being in Christ. And so uh, we're going to sing this song, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me, which is just a, a beautiful reminder and summation of these realities. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me Through the deepest valley he will lead Oh, the night has been won 
and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon And he was raised to overthrow the grave To this I hold, my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea Oh, the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, and not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. Day by day, I know He will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the rain is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. Would you join with me now in prayer? Father God, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you and praise you again for who you are. And in particular this morning, we thank you for the gift of your spirit. We pray that you would help us to know uh, the life and the peace and the fruit that you offer to us in your spirit. And we give you thanks and praise. But God, as we are together this morning, uh, my heart and many of our hearts are heavy today with many things in this world uh, come to light in this last week that are not... Uh, of you. They are far from you and far from the peace of your kingdom. And so as we enter into prayer today, we remember our profound need for you. You alone are Lord of all. You alone can change the brokenness that seeps into every layer of our world. Lord, have mercy. God, we think of the ways that we overlook one another's humanity and our inherent worth as your creation. And we think of the death this past week of George Floyd in the U.S. and the pain that is being expressed in the protests. Lord, have mercy. We join with your people in crying out for justice and for peace. And Lord, as Canadians, we love to think how much better we are when it comes to racial issues than our neighbors to the south. And would you open our eyes to see the ways that in our own country and communities, all people are not equal. Would you sustain our brothers and sisters of ethnic minorities who, for whom every day life carries different challenges? And would you help those of us of majority culture to better understand the privilege that we carry? Would you grow relationships between each of us? Would you grow relationships with, um, between us with those that look different from us? For it's only in relationship with one another that we learn to love and understand better the place of one another. God, would you infuse relationships? Would you bring them about and infuse them with your grace and with your profound love? God, in a week where we have heard about the abysmal conditions of living in care for our elders, we ask for your mercy. 
Would you draw us to our collective knees and in your kindness lead us to repentance for the ways that we have overlooked our elders, for the ways we have not cared, and for any ways that we have been part of a system that has undervalued the life of our seniors. Give us eyes to see all of your people in your light. Would you move in mighty ways right now at a time when um, people that have a particular power, our governments, companies, organizations, the public are more aware of the crevices and dysfunction in this system? And would you bring about drastic, brave, altruistic, and lasting change? Would you place in our society a new heart, one that honors our elders with appreciation and respect? God, we pray for an end to the outbreaks in the long-term care homes. We pray for new ways of operating to be forged. We pray for sustaining power for the personal support workers, nurses, doctors, and administrators who are involved in the active care for our seniors. And in particular this morning, we pray for the people who are part of our own congregation, including Veronica Carter, Margaret Cohen, and Dominic Prosser. And we also remember the many who are loved by members of our congregation, including our mothers, fathers, aunts, and uncles, and grandparents. In particular, Lord, we thank you today for Ann Brewster. We thank you for her love for you and your word. Would you allow your presence to be known deeply by her and her family at this time? God, we also want to pray and think of Frank Polari, who spent time in the hospital this last week with issues related to his heart. Lord, would you continue to provide excellent and timely medical care in this challenging time? And would you please fill Joan and Frank with your presence and your peace? God, we remember today another partner of ours in mission in the Ukraine. A long civil war has left Ukraine in ruins and unable to mitigate a COVID-19 outbreak and its economic fallout. Would you please be with and guide Ed Dixon, who's working there with loads of love, working to bring relief to orphans and families in need. And again, we pray, Lord, have mercy. And God, even in a season of heaviness, we have much to be thankful for. And we thank you for the provision of Canada Summer Student Grants for our church and our on-site sports partner. God, would you give wisdom to those making decisions about running camps this summer? And we thank you for the provision of funds to be able to hire students for the summer. God, we thank you again for the beautiful provision of new elders for our session team. Would you be with our session as it meets for the first time on Tuesday of this coming week in this new configuration? Would you give them much wisdom and discernment as they consider how to lead us well in these uncertain times? And God, as we think of this uh, new session team, we want to particularly give you our thanks and praise for Les Ferrier and Joan Knox. They both have served faithfully uh, for years in this capacity as leaders, part of our, as elders and part of our session team. God, we thank you for all that they have poured out. And God, I pray that in this season of them stepping back from uh, these visible leadership roles, would you pour back into them for all of the ways that they have loved and served you so faithfully. I pray that you would refresh them, you would replenish them, and that you would speak your words of truth and love over them at this time. And we just give you great thanks and praise for who they are, for all that they have offered of themselves, and for their faithfulness to you. God, in all things, we remember that our hope is in you. And even as things feel um, heavy and hard to bear this week, we remember, Lord, and look to the day where you will, as Revelation tells us, wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. And even as we look forward to that day uh, when we experience that in all of your fullness, we know that you and your kingdom are breaking in right now and that there is evidence of that new order, of that new way of doing things all around us. God, would you give us eyes to see the work that you are doing, and then would you give us courage to join in in the work of your spirit in our homes, in our city, in our church, and in our world. And we ask and pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Friends, let me remind you that after the service this morning, if you would like someone to pray with you, we have prayer ministers who are available, and there will be instructions about that in the comments section. 
and they would be happy to meet with you. There's also a talk back session today. Uh, we'll be discussing whatever you want to talk about, but we usually focus on what we've covered in the sermon, the passage we've read that morning, this morning, and also uh, anything else that might come up. So you're welcome to, to stick around for that. Um, I can't promise I'll explain predestination, but uh, I will ensure that John Calvin is present and not just Yoda. So friends, go in peace. May you know that God has chosen you in Jesus Christ, that you are blessed, adopted, redeemed, that the Holy Spirit seals all of that truth on your heart. So go now in the joy and the freedom of who you are in Christ and the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today in the week ahead and forevermore. Amen.